I'm your backup. Yeah. Redundancies. Redundancies. That's right. Culture. Back up your essential functions. Exactly. Okay. Well, I doubt that you made it to the end. So maybe I'll just start that one over again. Well, this is helpful. Yeah, Crimpy is not known for Zoom. In fact, y'all are the very first ever Crimpy Zoom students. So <laughs> this will make, make our time more efficient, but uh, thank you for hanging in there. Large outbuilding roof with good roofs that are well gutted can catch rainwater to roof tanks with overflows directed to good use. Rainwater gravity fed from these tanks to the house for domestic use. The house itself should be fitted with rainwater tanks which can be pumped up to the high tanks when needed in dry times. Wastewater can be directed to a septic tank and then a reed bed and onto an arbor effluent soak system terminating in a soak pit or soakage trenches. All valuable high storage dams should be fenced off from domestic stock animals and planted out to trees for stability, all except the constructed dam stroke pond wall itself, which can only be planted to trees without a tap root like willows in the cooler climate and clumping bamboos in the warmer climates. Okay, thank you, Jeff. What a story. So um, I won't go deep into all the different forms of dams because there's a lot, um, but I do want you to remember a few key principles about dams. First of all, as we've already discussed, uh, start with a dam in the highest feasible point on your site. And we'll talk in a moment about how to choose the best site for your highest dam. Secondly, um, every dam needs an overflow release. We've also mentioned that as well. Um, and why is that? Anybody know? It's not just because you want to be able to use it as a resource. It's because what will happen if there gets to be so much water in that dam that it starts spilling over the top? It'll break it. Absolutely. It's going to wash it downstream into your house um, or into the rest of your site. So you definitely, this is a mission critical to have uh, spillover. Uh, thirdly, you never plant trees with tap roots into dams, only shallow rhizomatic species that hold the soil well. So he mentioned a few of those. There are actually many that you could use. Vetiver grass is a great one for the tropics. Uh, there are a lot of willows that, you know, he mentioned that. Even crabgrass could be your friend here. Uh, You're only planting rhizomatic plants around dams? On, on the dams. So around the dams, right, on the left and the right, you can have big trees, right? And in fact, that can really help you, especially in a hot climate, by shading the water. Um, but on the dam itself, you see that gray crescent thing where you actually have the dam, um, which you probably would use clay to make um, if you have that available. Uh, you, you, you know, if you have any kind of soil-based dam, you would never plant tap roots into that because it's going to break it over time. So you would just use the shallow rooted stuff that can hold the soil in place. Thanks for your question. Um, you can also have dams in cold climates, uh, but forethought must be given to the shape of the catchment so that you make room for the expansion of ice on the upper portion of the catchment. Otherwise, it too could easily break your dam, right? All that water has a lot of pressure. Um, and when it, when it expands, wow. I actually had <clears throat> a little mystery going on with our uh, campus greenhouse. Uh, we currently have uh, an unsustainable um, irrigation situation set up where uh, we have a frost-free spigot 
that we've connected um, a hose to. And that hose has to go like 300 feet before it gets to the greenhouse. And that's where we have a timer set up with different zones. Um, now we have to leave the, the frost-free spigot open a little bit. So there's enough pressure to push the water out when the timer opens, right? And, and that's because we're doing, you know, we're doing overhead, uh, which, which needs a good amount of pressure uh, to get out. But, um, but it means that when the timer closes, there's nowhere for the water to go. And uh, that wasn't a problem until it got really hot. And um, the last week or so, like 10 days, we've had such hot weather that it literally exploded two of these heavy duty hoses um, because there was a combination of that pressure from the head and then the expansion of the water inside of that, that zone. So I fixed that by allowing it a little, just a little bit of leakage um, until we can get another frost-free spigot in our greenhouse. That's going to come in a couple of weeks. So. Anyway, all these uh, cycles of water are important to think about. All right, um, to close out our session tonight, we're going to talk about two more techniques, key lines and swales, both of which you'll get to see in action in the course. So first up are key lines. Um, this diagram shows uh, where you might have two catchments. They're, they're kind of in the shape of a cistern there. Um, and they're located in a place called the key point that I will help you learn how to identify. And uh, if you do gather water in a place like that, you can push it out to the upper parts of the ridges around there, uh, which is not where you would normally see water gather. Um, it, it doesn't actually flow uphill. You can't make water do that unless you, you're pushing it or pumping it. Um, but essentially, you can get it to a place that it wouldn't normally go because of the shape of the land. Uh, and so you can get a lot more surface area in irrigation. So to help you understand this, I'm going to work with a, a contour map here. Um, does everybody understand the idea of a topographic map where you've got the small black lines that are representing changes in elevation. So you see the top, there are like three summits um, towards the top there that are kind of in a light blue, whitish. And they, they have a circle at the top because that's, that's as high as you go. Um, but then as you move down every few feet, you know, in a regular increment um, that you descend in elevation, there'll be another contour line. The large black lines uh, represent a couple of different phenomena within the landscape. The, the horizontal one would be a, what Yeoman called a main ridge, which is that's, that's the, the highest ridge uh, along uh, a range. But then the three that are coming down diagonally, those, those he called primary ridges, and uh, those are essentially more ridges, um, but uh, as you move down, um, you can see that um, the, the, the water would not congregate in, on those ridges because it, it would be flowing down through the rills and the gullies, which you see um, represented there with, with the blue water watercolor. So here are two or actually three key points um, in this landscape. Uh, two of them have already been filled in with water. And then the, the third one on, on the right there has a sort of a black shape um, showing the exact place where the landscape moves from convex to concave. So at the high, on the higher point um, is where you find like the dome of the hill or, or the summit. And that's where it tends to be steeper, and that's the concave part. But then you get to a place as you're moving down, and the water moves in, the, in this direction as well, where it starts to be a valley or a canyon. Um, and that exact point where you go from convex to concave, that's known as the key point. Um, and Yeoman gave us that idea. 
So check this out. Uh, oh, here's a cross section of a hill from a, a different perspective where you can see, um, again, the same idea. So check it out. If you have those two, if you have dams catching water in those two key points, you can literally connect them by having, um, you know, a, a, a little ditch that, that carries the water from one to the other. Now, it's going to have to go slightly downhill, of course, to carry the water, but you're essentially staying at basically the same elevation, right? Um, and so that allows you to bring the water out over that ridge and into the next key point dam. Um, pretty ingenious stuff here, uh, because look what it allows you to do. Well, first of all, I should explain that... Um, in addition to building like a regular ditch, um, you, uh, you can also use what's called a key line plow, which essentially just just puts like a, a you know, a, a sharp edge down into the ground. Um, so you're not actually having that really disturbing effect that regular plows have, where it's, you know, breaking up all of the soil and whatever mycelia might be growing in there. Instead, you're just kind of putting a cut down into the ground um, that is enough for the water to seep, right? So um, here is ultimately what this system could look like. The green lines are the key lines. So how did you get water down from there? Well, pretty easy. You just, you, you, you dig those key lines with that plow across that contour or along that contour. And uh, any water that you release from the dam or that spills over in an overflow event will naturally be brought out to the right and left by those key lines. So you're able to, to vastly increase the amount of surface area that is at or below a place where water is being brought to. Okay, that's key lines. Any questions about key lines before we move to swales? Okay, great. Um, well, I'm going to let Jeff do some teaching here because it's just so good how it goes along with the diagram. And, and these earthworks, you know, um, the shape and the um, proportions really matter. So I'm going to let him give you some of those details here. Swales are carefully shaped ditches on contour with the soft, uncompacted earth excavated from the trench, forming a soft earth mound on the lower side. Swales on contour do not flow. They first stop, then spread, then infiltrate overland flow of water. Swales are tree growing systems and can also be part of hillside production access systems. So that's the basic idea there. Swales are tree planting technologies. Now they're different, which I, and I think he explained this, um, it, they're different than key lines because they are exactly on contour, right? Uh, a swale needs to be all the way across at the exact same elevation. That's what allows it to capture the water like that and have it seep in so uh, evenly. If you had just a little bit of elevation change one or the other, it's going to carry the water in that direction, which might be desirable depending on your situation. So there's totally such a thing as like a hybrid key line swale that's doing both at the same time. But a, a proper swale where you get the maximum infiltration in that exact place is always going to be exactly on contour because water will find that contour. Swales are... So here's a little bit about um, how to build swales. Hard surface runoff water concentration can be a great advantage to infiltrate into growing systems. Swales by roadsides provide tree water and shade that cools urban streets. These roadside swales will infiltrate water in 2 to 48 hours and provide ample irrigation after early vegetation establishment. Trees will overshade the swales, 
with climbing vines, shrubs as understory, and semi-aquatics occupying the base. The roadside swale has no mound and needs to have a perfectly level sill on both sides, but the base can have a variable depth if needed. The base can also be deep ripped, sanded, graveled, or planted. Lamonia are dry dams fed from hard surface runoff, traditionally from solid rock and complex foothills. They are surrounded by compacted earth walls that can hold one to 1.5 meters of water, which soaks into the soil within a few hours up to a few days. And in large rain events, overflow via a rock-based spillway. Diverse forests of productive species can be established in the base of Lamonia. Okay, I know he goes through a lot of information here, so I just wanted to explain that um, we're gonna make sure you get a good recording of this one. Um, I think that this, this technique will work a lot better, so you can go back and replay it as often as you want. Um, Hard service runoff. So um, here are some ideas about what, you know, how to actually use swales once you have them in place. The base of swales can be used as pathways along hillsides, mowed or controlled by carefully grazed geese or even larger animals such as small herds of cattle. The full potential of swale successions from the valley to the ridge vary with one, wet terrace swales possible at the bottom if charged with water from enough swale soaks from above, growing aquatic crops like taro, kangkong, rice, water chestnut or watercress. Two, windbreak swale with production in the swale in dry areas or maybe left as interswale in humid areas. Three, production swale of fairly hardy trees like mango or olive, trees that need less water and less attention. Four, ridge access swale running out to the ridge or left as interswale where ridge access is not required. The ridge access road that runs down the center of the ridge running water off both sides to four and six, and six on the leeward side of the ridge. Shelter from prevailing winds, more productive swales planted to wind tender trees like avocado and citrus. Swales can also be trellised to reduce evaporation and grow vine crop. Banana, coconut and papaya circle mulch bits can be included and small ponds, all increasing production and increasing diversity. Love how that horse is chilling out, not in their head and appreciation. The base. I think animals really love these systems. All right, and here's what it can look like later, you know, after it's had a chance to do a lot of uh, catchment. A well-developed swell can have many elements, even a trellis over the trench providing shade and productive crops. The lower side can have the productive trees plus crops like bananas and sweet potato as a ground cover, with little planted niches in the swell mound. If the swell is originally over heavy clay ground, it can be deep ripped in the base Bentonite can be added if it's sandy. Gypsum can be added if it's clay. Mulch or gravels or coarse sand can be added in the base layer. And all kinds of crops like melons, squash, taro, mints, parsley, even asparagus can be grown under a trellis. Irrigation and mulch need to be supplied for at least two to three years as the trees develop and mostly they will grow on the swale captured water. After two to three years, they start to overshadow the swale and no longer need mulch or water supply. Everything is supplied from the swale and within six to 10 years, they completely overshadow the swale itself 
and become a self-replicating, self-maintaining system where with very little inputs, there's a good yield from a well-planted system. Really great design ideas in there. Um, keep in mind, you know, uh, these you wouldn't all have in one place, like like um, Kahlo or, or Taro would, doesn't grow where asparagus does, uh, but you, you know, you use bits and pieces of these depending on your climate and situation. Um, that's a really useful concept as far as providing some of the benefits that will ultimately be uh, provided by the by the canopy trees long before they're big enough to do that you can you can get some quick quick growing vining plants doing the same thing for you all right one more swale thing um, this is just a good idea for how to how to provide some shade next to your house um, using the the runoff from from your roof Right, and this is the idea. You plant it down, uh, a vining plant along a trellis right down here in the, uh, in the swale area. Um, and within no time, you get a nice shade right next to your house. So as I mentioned before, not every technique is appropriate for every site. Here are a few guidelines that I, even these I would not hold you know, concretely, but generally the sweet spot for swales is when your slope grade is between three and 15%. Um, once you're more than 15%, you start to need terraces um, simply because the water runs off too fast to, to seep in. Um, in less than 3%, you know, yeah, you know, in certain places you could do that, but um, that's when you start to have a situation where there's not enough runoff um, in, you know, unless there are really big flood events um, to actually accumulate the water in the swale. But in a desert where you have really big rain events, on very flat um, desert landscape, you know, less shallow than swale banks on could, contour uh, are very easy in, and in cheap to called, install uh, and can hold back um, kilometers so of the audio, Adrian. This water will not only go trees on the mound, improving its function and efficiency, but it can also be bled off with swivel pipes to fields and infiltrated. This water can be used for opportunistic crops. So yeah, this would be a, you know, a, a useful situation for, for this uh, yeoman shallow swale. Okay, um, some similar ideas, but different shapes. Again, uh, these are like really, you know, mostly for the desert uh, in, in really arid climates where you have really big precipitation or runoff events. Um, intermittently, um, and you want to be able to catch those when they occur. Where large rills flow on awkward, steep, and restricted sites, the construction of earthworked boomerang pans catch and hold silt and water for spaced out tree sites. The erosion rill of the watercourse is initially divided, then each runnel of water overflowing from each boomerang is divided again and again across the site in large rain events. Each pan will need to hold up to half a meter of water and where available, the boomerang wall stabilized with rocks and the tree itself can be mulched with rocks. Right, another mention of rock mulching. Love that. My large, uh, and then one last one for you. Just that you know, so you can imagine they don't they don't have to be all swales in a straight line. You can you can have them place intermittently uh, through your environment. Love the boomerangs. Net and pan in elevation shows pans can be dug to hold up to half a meter of water in rains. The slope between the pans can be cleared of rocks, weeds, and clumping grasses, which can then be used for mulch in the main tree planting pans for better runoff results. Hardy tree legumes can be planted between the pans to help control erosion and can be cut for mulch, which can be spread around the trees in the pans. All right, let's hear it for net and pans. Um, I've seen some of these and some boomerangs in Morocco before. Net. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, do you want to see one more? <laughs> this is actually 
not for harvesting liquid water. It's for turning water vapor into liquid water through condensation. Um, a friend of mine, Alain Pevec, has been designing in Lima, Peru, and they've been using nets because they're, they're right on the ocean, but they're in a really dry place. So that's an ideal kind of situation to try to capture uh, the water vapor that's in the air um, before it evaporates away. Uh, you can actually have it condense in um, uh, any, any kind of structure like a net that has, um, that has a lot of little nooks and crannies uh, well placed. So this one is actually from um, the island of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. Traditional condensation pits on the island of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, which has only 125 to 150 millimeters of rain a year. And trees and vines are grown without any extra irrigation. The pits are dug eight to 10 meters across and one to three meters deep with one tree or one vine planted in each. The inside is carefully mulched with cinder ash which acts as a night condenser, trapping cold night air. The shade side of the pits are steeper, with a rock wall crescent for extra shade built around that side. Pretty fascinating techniques that have been developed out there Traditional over the many years of uh, inhabiting the land. So... There we are. I don't have any super inspiring comments at the end like I did on Tuesday, except for doesn't it make you thirsty? It's a lot of water to harvest out there, folks. <laughs> but that's it for our time. So any questions or reactions? It's a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of this, if you live in, in a human climate, um, you, you really don't have to have to worry about some of this stuff. Where do you live? Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, but we've been yeah. getting a ton of rain. Yeah, so, so have we. we. We've had an unusually uh, high level of precipitation this summer. That's exactly when you want to have your earthworks in place because th those those years only come around every so often. Mm -hmm. And if you if you've got your earthworks in place before they happen, then you're going to be able to get maximum benefit from mm -hmm. those bigger, either individual rain events or higher level uh, precipitation years. Yep. Any other questions or comments for Adrian? Cool, awesome. Thank you, Adrian. That was awesome. Um, so, just, I just any. I just want oh. to mention one thing real quick is that um, I lost the slideshow that I shared with y'all on Tuesday because my laptop died, and um, and. Mm -hmm. I, I want y'all to have the full thing. So at some point I'm going to reconstitute it and just do like a voiceover kind of thing for you. So you can see all those images, but I, I want y'all to have that as well. So, um, you know, you can use the video. It's, it's not useless. Um, but I think, uh, I think you'll get a lot more from me redoing it for you. Great. Thank you so much, Adrian. So I'll, yeah, I'll be sending that out, but probably not it might even be during the course, I would imagine. And so um, any other questions with regards to um, logistics at this point? This is Monique, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, at the, are we, are we expected to provide uh, water for ourselves for the 11 days that